I told you last time that Coakley claims desire is the constellating category of selfhood. Desire is the, how do I want to say this? Desire is the most fundamental thing about a human being. Desire is the clue left in our human natures that leads us back to God, right? Reminds us that our source is God, reminds us that we are destined to return to God. Desire is that longing for union with God. So in an important sense, God is the progenitor, the source of all human desires. Divine desire is the source of all human desire. We did it this way. We explained it using her Trinitarian formula last time. So the Father, in and through the Spirit, stirs up our hearts and arises in us all these sorts of desires. These desires, then, as they make their way back to God, are checked and purged by the Holy Spirit by being broken on the cross of Christ. You were remade into the image of the Son, and for Coakley, the Son here is the crucified Son. That's how Coakley can say that God is ultimately the source of all human desire, but still be able to provide a way out from saying that God underwrites every single human desire, because she's at pains to insist that many of these desires that we have are unholy, are abusive, and so on. So you want to be able to say that all desire comes from God in some important sense because it's this kind of clue left in our human natures that's supposed to lead us back to God, but not every desire of ours is holy. The way, one of the way, the paradigmatic way that you bring your desire back into comportment with God's, the way that you bring your desire into alignment with God's desire is through this process. The Father, in and through the Spirit, stirs up our hearts, our desire as it is put into the crucible, she says in this chapter, of divine desire, basically gets shot through Christ's crucifixion. All that is unholy is purged, and everything that is left on the other end is pure. So you don't get caught up, you don't get stuck on the cross, right? Even any more than Jesus gets stuck on the cross. The ultimate goal is delight, is bliss, and so on. So this theory, importantly, is a way of thinking through how desire is either holy or not, pure or not, that has never once made reference to gender. This was the upshot, I said at the end of last week's class, of insisting that desire is prior to sex. Desire is prior to gender. Desire is the fundamental question we ought to ask when asking about sexuality. I'll take questions about that at the end. That does not mean, though, I mentioned last time, that Coakley has nothing at all to say about gender, right? Just because the real question she thinks we ought to ask about sexuality has to do with desire and not with gender doesn't mean that she doesn't have some account of what happens to gender as it makes its way into God. This leitmotif, or the tune that we're going to hum, and we're going to have variations on it throughout the book, this is going to stay true for what she has to say about gender. We are making our way into God in some fashion. Just though, as we suggested last time, um, you're not going to stay untransformed as you make your way into God. Just as your desires don't stay the same as you offer them up to God in prayer, so also you will not remain the same. And this is what she's trying to work out in those 10 to 11 pages from chapter 1. There are three sorts of difference. This is where the new stuff starts. There are three sorts of difference in classical Christian thought. There's the difference of the Trinity, the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay, This is the first sort of difference. 
The second sort of difference is the difference between God these are supposed to be continents and the world okay this is the God creation difference or it's sometimes called ontological difference as she calls it in chapter one and then there's a third sort of difference a difference that's imaged within creation which is sexual difference. The question for theologians is always how to put these three together. How do you say they're related to one another? How do you say, do you say that they ought to be identified with one another in some fashion? Do they affect one another? Or do they have nothing to do with each other at all? But this is the kind of these are the kind of building blocks of the puzzle that she's going to put together in what follows. So three sorts of difference. The difference between the Trinitarian persons, the difference between God and creation, and then the difference between us, which is understood as our sexual difference, the division or the slicing of all creation into <coughs> male and female. So Copley, of course, is concerned to answer what happens to this. As I suggested, this is not, like working with these three sorts of differences, not like a new theological problem. It's something that lots of people have done. She says on page 57 that there's always been a temptation to align this sort of difference with this sort of difference in what she thinks is too easy and too dangerous a way. You hear people talk like this all the time, actually. It's actually really common. It's kind of a common sense reading of a passage from Ephesians. It goes back to a certain way of reading the Song of Songs, and so on. This should feel pretty intuitive to you whenever I say it. On one side, you've got The God world relation. On this side, I must have that. you've got Christ and the church, right? God, Israel, male, female pretty evident who's on top and who's on bottom. And there's not a lot of movement going on between these two things. If you're in one, you're probably in it. God, Christ, Yahweh, men. The world, creation, the church, Israel, women. It is hard to overstate the deleterious consequences this has caused for women in the history of Christianity. Coakley is concerned to upset this picture. One example, just to put it out there, one example of somebody who runs a theory of gender like this one is Karl Barth. That's one thing. Uh, there are too many to really count. But there's one that you can kind of like take home with you and go look at it. Anyway, she's concerned to upset this picture. She's also concerned, though, that there's a generation, she claims, of feminist theologians who have tried to solve that set of problems by simply visioning sexual difference on analogy, not to ontological difference. But to the Trinity, okay. That kind of intuitively sounds like it might be a better option, right? Okay. So if this, if this is not the right move, if we shouldn't try to make sexual difference be like the relationship between God and creation, then maybe sexual difference is something like the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That kind of sounds interesting or promising. At least maybe it would avoid this set of problems. 
but she says that's not quite good either. She says, more recently, some feminist theology has attempted in reaction to this move to figure sexual difference on analogy with the difference between God and creation, to model gender on Trinitarian difference, to straightforwardly emulate a Trinitarian equality in difference. Her position is that neither of these more familiar alternatives is possible, nor even obviously mandated by the complex authorities of scripture and tradition. So that's one argument she has for it, is that there's just not enough scriptural data to justify saying that this is this, or that these are on an, exist on analogy to one another. Rather, in the case of human gender, she says, there is a subtle transformation of both models caused by their intersection. This is where she makes a more substantive claim. She says that, I'm on page 58 at the top. This is where she makes a more substantive argument than just saying, okay, so for one thing, there's not a lot of scriptural warrant for saying that sexual difference is supposed to image Trinitarian difference just because. Her second theological argument is that actually trying to go straight from this to this ignores the fact that it has to go through this first and the fact that this and this are aligned with one another. They intersect. It's not like you've got the Trinity over here and then God's relationship with creation over here. Rather, God is in a relationship with creation that simply is Trinitarian. That's pretty intuitive. It's what we did last week. This is the intersection of these two. Does that make some sense? That's what I think she means by saying that there can be a subtle transformation of both models caused by their intersection. This is the way that we traverse the ontological difference between us and God and make our way into God. The fixed, fallen differences of worldly gender, she says, are transfigured precisely by the interruptive activity of the Holy Spirit drawing gender into Trinitarian purgation and transformation. So not only is it that your desires are being offered to God in this process, but also your very self, your whole self. And as the whole self makes its way to God, it's not going to, it's not going to be unchanged. Something's going to happen. In fact, something very similar to what she was saying happens with, um, with our desires as they're checked and purged by the Spirit and brought into the image of the cruciform Son. Our fallen, stuck gender is rendered labile, she says. Flexible. Fluid. We're going to flesh that out. Don't worry. This is just generally what she's trying to do. Tunis, one might say, is divinely ambushed by threeness. We count three differences in this picture. We count two differences in this one and two in this one, don't we? There are three we know, not Watson. The Trinity, as I've said before, there are two elements in our logical difference, God and creation, and there are two right here. This threeness has to ambush this two-ness in some fashion. Now, she says she's not saying She's not saying a couple of things. Here are the two things she's not doing. First of all, she's not saying there's a kind of magical third gender that we're all going to become eschatologically, okay? <laughs> so the answer is not that there's, um, like, we're you've got two right here. We're going to go two plus one equals three, okay? That's not what we're going to do. The other thing she's at pains to say, she doesn't mean, is she does not think that this is going to be totally obliterated. She does not think that gender will go away entirely. Rather, its fallenness will be checked. What does she mean by fallenness? Copley's in dialogue with a generation of with a generation of secular gender theory, exemplified by the scholar Judith Butler. If it's helpful to you, great. If not, let it go. These 
secular gender theorists generally see gender as performative. It's a way that we perform our identities in some fashion. But there's not a lot of wiggle room in this performance for one reason or another, either because they are um, either because society enforces gender performances and their contours so strictly that there's not a lot of wiggle room, or because just materiality as such, the like the kind of material substrate of your physical sex, simply doesn't allow for much fluidity, changeability, etc. So she says in another essay, there's a kind of melancholy about secular gender theory. There's this sort of desire to render gender flexible, fluid, because they all have the sense that to straitjacket or slice humanity into two is somehow lacking, insufficient, and oppressive. The idea is basically this. And this is the way that most of us think about gender, commonsensically. I have a male body that expresses itself through a male gender performance, right? I have a female body which expresses itself through a female gender performance. Given this, it almost seems too easy to do some quick math and say that all relationships are supposed to look like the addition of these two things. Just add together male and female, and you get what love is supposed to look like. This is something that Judith Butler calls the heterosexual matrix. Okay, so You will have a male body that expresses itself through a male gender, female body, which expresses itself through a female gender, and these two complement each other, complete each other, and they issue in a heterosexual relationship. But there's no movement between these two things, right? There's not a lot of flexibility for one reason or another. And Coakley says, no, 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 Christians have a different way of thinking about gender. There's actually quite a lot of transformation that's supposed to happen, according to Christian theology, having to do with gender. She says that as gender makes its way into God, it's rendered labile, flexible, fluid. It sounds a little crazy to us initially, but it has a very, 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 very long and storied Christian theological heritage. Notwithstanding the fact that you do not hear priests or preachers talk about it all that much, perhaps because it just makes us feel weird. <laughs> or uncomfortable. But it is there. Lord have mercy. Is it there? One of the places that Coakley has gotten this is from Gregory of Nyssa. I just want to read something to you from Nyssa. Nyssa being one of the early church fathers. In one of his homilies, it's homily four, he's speaking of the church as Christ's bride. Okay? It's not too crazy. It's from Ephesians. The marital, no, the love that Christ has for the church is like a marital relationship. You can connect that back to Song of Songs. Not too crazy. The church is the bride of Christ. Right? Okay. So he's speaking of the bride's transformation into a lily. Having thus become a flower, the soul is not injured by thorny temptations in her transformation into lily. She forgets the people and the house of her false father and looks to her true father. Therefore, she is named the sister of the son, having been introduced by the spirit of adoption into this relationship and released from the fellowship with the daughters of the false father. And so she becomes still more sublime and gazes at the mystery through Dove's eyes. I mean, she does this by the spirit of prophecy. Her explanation is this. Because Gregory is here charting the highest and third stage in the ascent into God, it is crucial for him that the soul or bride is figured as feminine, as receptive to the bridegroom's advances. What's interesting about this for her is that there's a kind of bombardment of sonship and being the sister of 
Jesus in this idea of adoption. So when you receive the spirit of adoption, when you receive the gift of sonship, when you when the spirit prays within you, Father, allowing you to occupy the place of the Son in the Trinity, you become a woman. You become a bride. But it doesn't end. It doesn't end there. Because in the same homily, we find our last and most alluring and complex Trinitarian allegory. She says, here the feminine soul or bride is wounded by the arrow of divine love and then in turn becomes another arrow ready to be shot by the divine bowman. Now these are, okay, so we've got a lot of metaphors flying around. <laughs> but just, just try to follow the metaphors just for a minute. So the bridegroom is wounded by the arrow of, I'm sorry, the bride is wounded by the arrow of divine love. Is receptive to divine love. Is female, is the bride, receptive to the, receptive to the, the, the love of the bridegroom. But then, in turn, she becomes another arrow ready to be shot by the divine bowman. When we untangle these different, even chaotically related, tell me about it, <laughs> images, we have the father as an archer, the son as the arrow, and the spirit as that which is dipped. Oh, I'm sorry, as, and the spirit as that into which the arrow is dipped. The idea is that the father is the bowman. The father takes the arrow, which is the son, and dips the arrow in the spirit and then shoots the arrow into the human being. This is the metaphor he's using to describe the way that God's love works. The arrow penetrates the soul with the wound of love, just as the son as the bridegroom also penetrates and takes possession of the bride. But the, the bride then herself becomes an extension or replication of the son's arrow, because she has been allowed to participate in his eternal incorruptibility. So at the very height of the mystical ascent, all human beings, according to Gregory, become brides. All human beings become women. Become female. But it's a complicated sort of femininity. So this femininity is not merely receptive. This, feminin this femininity is also active. This femininity penetrates. It becomes an extension of of the son's arrow. What Coakley's trying to do with pointing us back to these early Christian examples of a chaotic, a chaotic profusion of and proliferation of gendered metaphors and images is to show us that gender is just a whole lot more complicated than we might initially think that it is, especially for Christians. Gender is not like this. It is not stuck. In Gregory's writings, he conceives that the soul, in his journey up to God, changes genders over and over and over and over and over. It just depends on where in the mystical ascent you are. What we just talked about is what your gender might be at the very top of the mountain top of Mount Sinai, because uh, Gregory, like Dionysius, is using this image of Moses ascending Mount Sinai as a kind of image or metaphor for the ascent of the soul to God. In any case, there's a kind of proliferation of gender metaphors. It's complicated. In any case, you don't end up being exactly what you started. Your gender is rendered flexible, fluid. Labile. It still exists. She still thinks that in the eschaton, in the resurrection of the dead, we will have gender, understood as, she says, as embodied difference. We'll still have bodies. Those bodies will still be different. They'll still be gendered differently. But it will not be the stuck, fallen gender of the secular gender binary. I am a male. I perform gender as a male. I am eternally male forever and ever and ever. Amen. And then my counterpart who compliments me, female, a woman who performs feminine gender identity forever and ever and ever. Amen. She says that cannot be the case because gender is supposed to be rendered subject, 
into God's transformation in the spirit as the soul makes its way into God. Is it the most important thing? No, no, no. Let me say it this way. Is gender on this account what one ought to look at when deciding whether or not a relationship is holy? No. The answer to that is desire is what you ought to look at because desire is more fundamental. But secondarily, it's hard to understand what exactly, how exactly you might point to gender. If one was trying to adjudicate the morality and holiness of relationships between human beings on its basis, what do you point to? Okay, so right now, I might be gendered male in my journey of the soul into God. At another point, in this journey, a lot of these theologians say, I might be female. And I might be male again, and I might be female, and I might be male again, and I might be female, and I might be male again. Where exactly do you point? So it's hard to see that gender would be the sort of thing that actually could adjudicate between the holiness of embodied relationships between Christians. 